everybody, Young Grasshopper here. Welcome to the Clipside Bunker in Toronto, Ontario, Canada. And this is a strategy video. It's a sequel or a part two to another strategy video I posted just recently called What Makes Great Players Great. And I got such a tremendous response from the community about that video. I thought I would extend it, make a part two. And I have more points here, many of them suggestions brought up by those in the comment board. So I appreciate that, guys. And uh, so I think it's just a testimony to our community that we all want to be better players. We all want to improve no matter what level we're at. Um, maybe there's something in the five points I mentioned in the last video and these five points here that is going to help you and just sort of allow you to contemplate something that would make you a better player. And of course, my strategy videos are always for new players. I say that all the time. I want new players that are entering the hobby to sort of uh, pro uh, sort of propel themselves forward a lot quicker than they normally would. But there's something here for everybody, and I feel that by the response that I got from my last video. So thanks a lot, guys. I appreciate it. I got s five more points here. The first one is got to do with the blurb that I put at the end of my last video. I was uploading that up after I stopped recording and I remembered that I just put a little blurb at the bottom I thought it was going to be the only video that I put up but number six and I'll mention that one they know the rules inside and out great players know the rules inside and out and I can think of a great player never met him face to face but Carl Seven out on the west coast he is a law graduate and I think there's a lot of law school graduates in the community. I think he's a lawyer by profession. I'm not sure. But to me, I would imagine that him reading the rule book inside and out would be like reading the back of a cereal box for him, right? For us, it's difficult because of the two rule book system and just the way that the everything's fragmented from page to page you got the global rules at the bottom or the back of the rule book and it's just a really hard thing to get through you've got examples uh, from Pacific scenario and then the same rule is now used in the Europe rule book as a specific example pertaining to that theater and they go further than just reading it i mean basically what they're doing is they're trying to look through the cracks and see loopholes they're trying to find ways in which they can get the rules to um, appeal to their advantage and a perfect example of this is the way carl seven came up with a, or found a hole a crack in the rules i suppose and he was responsible for the gambit called the sneaky carl and basically you need to know the rules inside and out now i want to mention the fact that in the rules they talk about hostile sea zones neutral sea zones and friendly sea zones and basically that's a tough one to wrap around because that system is supposed to encompass uh, yes and no questions to anything that you can throw at it and I've never really quite learned it myself personally um, and then when Carl brought up this sneaky Carl move obviously it required a deep understanding of that particular formula what makes a C zone hostile neutral or friendly right and you know we can do something about this we can read the rule books ourselves we can go through them a second time we may not have the savviness to look for areas and loopholes where we can manipulate the rules to our advantage and come up with something like that but i mean the last thing we want to do is make a mistake because we don't know the rules i remember a game and i was doing an amphibious assault on the philippines i had a carrier and some transports and I put the planes from the carrier on the Philippines and he scrambled the single plane and he said you lose all your ships and we were all kind of new but um, 
I was trying to scratch my head at how I could do that, how I could lose all my ships. Well, the carrier doesn't have an attack value. The transports are definitely vulnerable. And I landed everything from the transports there, plus the planes from the carrier. So with the scramble coming into the sea zone, um, I was trying to figure out, everybody around the table is trying to tell me I lose everything, right, without even a dice roll. And I had no choice to accept it because I didn't know the rules. Now later, much later, um, being on AxeAndAllies.org, being on the forum about frequently asked questions, which is another um, method or resource in which great players use to truly understand everything about the rules, I found out that um, I could have taken a hit if the fighter did hit um, and had just damaged the carrier and left and retreated. Now, that might seem obvious to many people, but at the time, that was a long, long time ago, I was trying to figure out what the rule was, and we couldn't find it in the rule book easily, which is another issue, another problem, maybe an advantage that the great players have over us because they're willing to do the work, to read through it, look through it, find out where all these little nuances are in the rule book. Um, and... You know, later after understanding that, it's like, of course I can take a hit and retreat, right? I still would have lost some stuff, right? And I never go into things like that um, again with just what I had at the time. But this is where experience will teach you something. But I don't think experience alone makes you great just simply because there's, there's just way, way too many of us, too many average players that have been playing for decades and we have a hard time learning from our experiences and whatnot um but i definitely look at naval bases a lot more <laughs> on the board and this was a long long time ago i've grown much more as a player but i still wouldn't call myself great even if i've been playing this long so we can we can learn the rules especially those types of rules and yeah it's painful it's like sitting in a dental chair trying to read those books but Guys, great players like Carl Seven um, can just flip through it so easily, understand it, and it's written in many ways like that, like a law document. Not a fun read, right? But there's nothing that you can really take out of the rule books and see a contradiction. You can't see um, a discrepancy or anything everything can be answered and it's been tested for years over at axnallies.org where kevin chapman the designer of the rule books um is over there still today answering questions so a great resource i'll put a link in the description box let's move on to point number two or sorry point number seven point number seven they build scripts then react accordingly they can build a script and react accordingly and a lot of people that don't like the game or have moved away from the game say it's too scripted well that's the nature of it i mean if you think of chess right lots and lots of great chess players make scripts i'm going to move my pawn here for turn one my knight there turn two and so on and so on until down the road maybe 20 uh, moves later they've got you in checkmate Right? But here's the thing about scripts. Even though you can build a script, doesn't necessarily mean that everything's going to pan out that way. Maybe the opponent makes a move that sort of makes that script a little bit vulnerable now. But the second part of that, they then they react accordingly. So this is called reactionary play. So I was watching a video on Detroit's channel where Gargantua was making a video on how to do a sea lion and lots of people have done sea lion videos i've done it right but there was something different about the way he explained sea lion and you know he hit a lot of points that i hit but it's just the way you can see his thinking and his thought pattern i'll put a link in the description box of this video where you can go see that and uh, if you don't know gargantua you'll meet him in that video and um he'll show you uh the script first and foremost so all great players have a script for Sea Lion. All great players have a script for um, a Japan Calcutta Crush. All great players have a script for uh, a Moscow Advance. All great players have a script for 
taking down capitals, you know, whether you're the Axis, whether you're the Allies. It's a little bit harder as the Allies because you need more reactionary play. But, I mean, even the Spanish beachhead is a script, right, for the Allies. But it's one thing to have a script, and in my opinion, you must have a script. Um, you can't execute a play like Sea Lion unless you do have a script. You can't go into Sea Lion thinking, I'll just see how it goes. It doesn't really work that way. Um, but he details in that video having a script for Sea Lion, but then he'll point out certain things that if they go a certain way, it's going to change your direction. It's going to change your overall strategy and plan. And there comes a time when you just got to abandon the script. So great players know how to react when the script kind of goes off track. But here's the thing. How many scripts do these great players have, right? Um, for example, like... What happens in the Mediterranean can all be scripted out. What if there's a Toronto raid? What if there's not a Toronto raid? And then there's so many scripts that go off of the options of those two. And, I mean, you need to be able to execute a plan. And a script is just a plan. You have a plan. We have all spent many, many hours staring at the table alone. Just if I do that, if I go there, if I buy that, if I do that. So, I mean, the reactionary play part comes in more so for them simply because a lot of us don't get off of our script quite as easily. We had a plan coming in. We really want to try it. We want it to work. And if there's monkey wrenches that get thrown into our overall strategy... Um, we have to have the discipline to abandon that and just send it off to college and say not today and do something more responsible. Um, so check out that video uh, and don't don't be against scripts. Um, make them and try to execute them and more importantly try and react. Like for example, um, a golf player. We all, and I, I actually associate Axe and Allies a lot with the game of golf because we all step to the tee at the first, uh, on the first hole. We all want to have a perfect game. We all want to have a perfect round of golf, a perfect round of Axe and Allies. And of course, when we slice it and it goes into the woods, that's like rolling bad dice. Or, you know, when we're in the woods, we have to adjust, we have to react, we have to maybe chip it out safely instead of going for the hole now because there's a big tree in front of us and things like that you know what i mean um so i mean a lot of the exhilaration of starting an axe now as game is having that perfect game because you got it all planned out you know how you're going to play each hole you know how the green goes how fast the green is uh for a perfect putt but of course just like any pro golf player <laughs> Uh, even the great players, their script goes in the woods, right? So, reacting is really important. Number eight, point number eight, they play online and they use battle calculators. It's pretty straightforward. They play online and they use battle calculators. Playing online is going to allow you to test strategies. It's going to allow you to test scripts. You can play solo. You can play with an individual. You can play with a bunch of individuals. You can just try and experiment and do different things plus you learn from other people it's really really invaluable maybe that's why i'm not great i mean like i can think of a hundred reasons why i'm not a great player but definitely one of them is i don't uh, go online and play multiple games and learn things and you can learn from what the great players are doing right because you know why did they buy that why did they place it there why did those move there and you can see their whole script pan out. Um, and then now you sort of understand the three plain German by, right? Whereas that's kind of new or um, just just so much to learn by playing online. And it's the same thing for poker players, right? The more hands that you play, the more you're going to know what to do with the same hand when you're 
live at an actual table in a tournament, right? Um, but the battle calculator, same thing. A lot of people think that they're totally against battle calculators because it like, feels like cheating. Here's the thing about it though, maybe around the table with the, your friends, maybe it is cheating. Maybe you don't, you shouldn't be using a battle cal calculator around a table. You definitely won't be using battle calculators at my tournament in 2022. But, you know, using a battle calculator helps you get past your gut insta instinct and start making decisions with your head, right? Because if you've run certain battles through a battle calculator enough times it's gonna start to become natural to you in a, in a game table in a tournament when you don't have that battle calculator to remember how things kind of went right now i've got friends like jerry the jerry will sit there and count pieces there's a formula for that he adds things up quickly and then he can step back after 30 seconds and say you've got the odds you know, you're up by, you know, 10 points or whatever. Um, I always just use my gut. I mean, um, I think maybe in the future after shooting these two videos, I'm going to start looking at these seriously, right? But <clears throat> um, there's nothing wrong with using a battle calculator online. I mean, everybody does it. Um, it's acceptable. Um, you know, around the table, you don't want to use it because it takes up time. Plus, people raise an eyebrow at you, you know, can't you make a decision yourself, right? People like my friend Jerry, they just do it in their head and they got a formula. I don't think it's the same formula. I mean, he's not running the scenario 2,000 times through his head, right? <laughs> um, but that's what a battle calculator can do, right? So don't be ashamed uh, to use a battle calculator and play online if you want to get better. And play players that, you know... Are, are good you might want to go on there and play a solo game to start off um, just ask people if they want to play and see how you stack up to just the random people that offer you a game you could get annihilated you could end up doing well point is don't get too high don't get too low because you're gonna now want to enter a tournament or ask a couple people who are good at the tournaments to have a game with you right and you just want to go into it humbly and honestly just get a couple of games and see what great players do. And even if you don't want to play, I mean, I've been learning a lot just simply by going and um, spectating on a, on a particular game for my tournament edition rules. And I'm actually learning quite a bit what great players are doing. A lot of it looks pretty aggressive for me, right? But, um, you know, they're just uh, great players are aggressive uh, because they learn it online. And then afterwards they implement it into the table game and they know how to adjust right they'll react right whether to be all out aggressive on one particular territory because that's what they would do online or pull back and just say you know what it's going to be a long day uh, maybe now is not the time they know when the right decision is just like a poker player he's not going to play you know, ace jack the same way at a table as he does online. It's just the way it is, right? So, point number nine. Point number nine now. Uh, they know the power of fodder. Great players know the power of fodder. Um, fodder is just a cheap unit that you can build many of. Like, for example, a stack of infantry is called fodder. A stack of subs or destroyers is called fodder. Even AA guns can be fodder, but I'm not suggesting that anybody's buying those. But, you know, mechanized infantry are cheaper than tanks, and that's fodder. The reason being is when you're calculating odds in an Axe and Allies game, you're not just calculating the power of the units, which is obviously their combat value, whether they're defending or attacking. Like, a tank at three or less is obvious what its power strength is. Or an infantry defending at two or less it's obvious what their power strength is but you know there's another element to it the number of hits right um so this basically means how many infantry can you soak how like and i'm not just talking about just straight up counting the units right because obviously different units have different strength different power but you know a large 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 stock stack of infantry against 
you know, some infantry, a lot of tanks, a lot of aircraft, it's going to work out different as far as how many hits that can be soaked up. And, you know, they know the power of that equation, the, the fodder. Um, in large, large battles, if your first casualties coming off are powerful units, you don't have any fodder. Same thing in a naval battle, right? Um, so, you know, I think in, a, in the same video that Gargantua was in talking about Sea Lion, he talked about how uh, he loves buying mechanized infantry for Russia. Now, I've never really myself personally, I was on the fence about this, um, but people in our group, as far as mechanized infantry for Russia, just doesn't happen. Now, I bet you online, there's lots of that going on, but Gargantua kind of alluded to the fact that this was one of his things that people just scoff at, say, you know, what are you doing that for or whatever, but he swears by it. And I think it's just because he knows the power of fodder. He does the equations. He knows that he can get more mechanized infantry on the board than he can tanks and things like that. And it's all about the mobility of them. They can move fast. They can get to where they need to go. They can counter strike. They can push uh, Germany if there was a sea lion and things like that. He's got a whole agenda around specific buys. And yeah, they do know what to buy. They know what to buy and they know when to buy it and where to place it and you know <clears throat> so number 10 number 10 they are surgical with their turns they are surgical with their turns i mean i don't know about online right i mean obviously some people take a long time to do their turn because maybe they gotta go grocery shopping they'll come back and they'll do their turn or you know maybe they're they're fast and they post it quick but you never know maybe they take a long time and then they post it you never know just how long they're really taking i think that's the way online play works but around the table i mean you can tell if somebody's hesitating you can tell if somebody just doesn't know what they're uh gonna do you can tell if people are just searching the board for the next move whereas i've noticed this a lot around the table with great players they know exactly what they want to do and they're going to move right away. They're going to roll and they get upset when people take their time rolling. And they're going to place their units. They're going to collect their money and they're going to say done. They're done and it's fast and it's over with. And every round it seems like that. Now, it's easy to look at this in the way of chess right like i was watching a movie not too long ago called searching for bobby fisher it wasn't a very good movie i don't recommend it but there was one aspect to it is how fast these uh players were playing like they had the tables in the park right and a lot of the community would be there playing speed chess and it was amazing when they're just banging the clock move bang move bang move bang and each player is doing that just bang bang it's like you see the piece move, but all you hear is the clock. Bang, 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 bang. So it's speed chess, right? And I mean, if you're sitting there and somebody is like looking and looking and looking at the board and you say, you know, it's your goal, right? And it's like, yeah, I know, you know, you're just checking, right? Because I hope you're not waiting for me to go. But um, it's the same thing around the table. I've seen it for many, many years. The better players move faster. Now, I'm not saying that this is something that you should do to become a great player. I'm just saying that this is something that comes with being a great player. So don't move fast desiring to be a great player. Do all these points first, become a great player, and then you'll see that you do this. Because they've got their scripts, they've got their reactionary play, they've got their tactics and their timing and their positioning uh, down packed, and they just they just instinctively and naturally move their pieces fast and they blow through their turn turn sequence and they just say collect my money i'm done right who's next and it's like wow that's fast and it's like you know you kind of conversely see the other side of the coin with people taking a long long time to go through their um their turns like myself sometimes i'm not an overly slow player but i'm not an overly fast player but sometimes a lot of people just staring at the board for minutes and minutes and minutes um just staring at the board not moving anything um there comes a time where it's like 
you got to decide what it is you're thinking about, right? And I think that when people are spending that much time thinking, it's a clear, sure-cut sign that they don't know what they're going to do, right? I mean, sure, you want to examine the board and know their options, right? So that's going to take some time. But why is it that fast? Uh, great players do this so fast, though? I think it's just a product of all these other points that come up. Um, so I do want to make another mention because during the video I thought about this, and I think I remember a couple of people saying this as well, and it's got to do with position and timing position and timing there are spots on the board where a single fighter will reach more territories than the spot right next door to it and obviously an air base will help movement right but that in itself is the best place sometimes strategic place sometimes but i'm talking about in, in the middle of nowhere in the eastern front or in africa or whatever when there are no air bases there are spots on the board territories islands whatever that give you more spread than other places and the great players know the map know exactly where these places are like the 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 best example the easiest example the most obvious example is the caroline islands right we all know uh being frustrated with america trying to get into the fight that the caroline islands is the best sea zone for position just simply because of the amount of areas that we can reach that are within our reach from that spot and great players know exactly where all these spots are like for example um i can't see it but the sea zone off gibraltar where america usually goes great players want to have good air cover for that spot landing is always a problem so they know what they need to do to take a landing spot where they need to be as far as um, their air force to be able to cover that sea zone so they look at the places where the enemy wants to go they position and make sure that they're in the right territory to be able to reach that cover not just that but other areas like for example if you are in ukraine you can't hit so and so but if you're up in the north and uh, Novograd you can hit that but you can't reach home so there's some place on the board that they know in the middle where it'll allow you to reach both places um, so know the map know the positions know uh, not just for aircraft either for for ships coming off naval bases or or not or tanks and mechanized infantry reaching uh, one place one direction and another place in the other direction rather than being one territory to the right or left and not being able to reach that one so position is huge and also timing so you will hear great players talk about timing all the time for example um, in that video about sea lion gargantua talks about you know this has to happen this round this has to happen this round and then you land on turn three and that's an easy one because we're starting right at the beginning of the game so timing i'm going to buy my 10 transports turn two i'm going to land turn three has to be turn three um but a lot of great players have russia being easier for them to attack moscow as germany turn five and the odds worsen each round afterwards. So not only are they able to think about odds easily because they have a lot of experience with a battle calculator, but they're also able to um, project what the odds might be in future rounds, right? So, I mean, it is one thing to know what's going to happen. It's like playing nine ball billiards right i mean you've got a perfect shot lined up for the ball that you need but the next ball that you have to sink is over here you got to make sure not only do you sink that but you got enough spin or you're going off the bank in a certain angle to make sure you're lining up to get the next ball that you have to hit um they do this very well but they also understand that nothing works perfect 
they can land in a sand trap or in the drink so they adjust and they know how to react and they do it quite well and they can shift their entire focus and I wouldn't even be surprised if they can create a whole script on the fly right at least three rounds it's like okay if this script that kind of fell if this plan is kind of no more they got to adjust and come up with a new thing they're not just going to float around and buy things and move here and move there and try and scare you and back off and get get them off you right no they're they've got an objective in mind they've got an achievement they want to gain um even if it's not the one that they thought it was and there's a lot of discipline in just getting off the plan getting off the script right and a lot of us we grow attached to that plan just like we grow attached to our units right somebody in the comment board said that um great players uh are okay with losing units right and i kind of mentioned this a little bit in my first part but yeah great players you know don't grow attached to their units they know exactly which ones to take off to if you haven't seen my Battleboard Basics series, check it out. Um, there are so many tactical, strategic decisions to make in resolving combat. One combat round to the next combat round to the next combat round. That's a whole other level, right? Um, I'd be interested in getting uh, the opinions of some great players if there's anything to that process or if it's just as straightforward as we may think it is, right? Um, anyway, uh, so just to summarize, turn number six, they know the rules inside and out. We can do that. We can work on doing that. They build scripts and react accordingly. This is a bit of a necessary, uh, evolvement that we need to evolution that we need to, uh, grasp. Uh, they play online and use the battle calculator. Now I'm going to probably resist this one as much as I can, but I'd say it's more possible now for myself to kind of do that as much as I hate looking at a screen and pushing buttons, but um, my tournament edition rules are online now, so there's a better chance I go on there and, and play a little bit more. Knowing the power of fodder, this is something that I need to work on. Um, I always want to get uh, some nice big shiny aircraft carriers and battleships sometimes, or some strategic bombers. A uh, big stack of strategic bombers are always nice, but they understand that using the same amount of money to get more units are going to change the battle in a different way than just the power and strength of those units, right? And they are very surgical with their turn sequences. They go fast. And this isn't so much a point that we should focus on and work on. I think it's just a product of doing all these things. I think once you become great, eventually... Um, the signs of greatness is that you see players just go through the turn sequence really quick, right? Um, they know exactly what they want to do, when they want to do it, and they're doing all the things that we're struggling to do. They know our options, they're sizing us up, they're getting into our heads, and they're going through their turns real fast, right? So um, I hope that was helpful, guys. I really appreciate uh, the response that I got from this little mini-series now, uh, the first one, of course. And hopefully I touched on a lot of it. I won't be doing a turn three, so if you put a suggestion in the comment, uh, again, please just, um, you know, go do that because along the way, new players are going to come and they're going to not only watch the video, they're going to see the comments. So if you have something to add, please do. Um, but, uh, I think it was just really, really good to just talk about this and it allows us to have some self-reflection. Are we great players? Um, you know, how badly do I want to improve? And I'm not saying that you must do these or you won't be a great player. I'm not saying that at all. Right. But this is a great foundation. Um, a couple of great players have reached out to me after my first one and said real good points, excellent points, you know, um, you know, so, uh, it was just fun to do and thanks a lot guys. Really appreciate you tuning in. Thanks for subscribing. Thanks for liking. Thanks for commenting. Thanks for sharing my videos and may all your rules be once. Take care and see you in the next video.